Dr. Thanks for inviting me to give this talk on the basics of uveitis. My name is Nima Gadiri. I'm a medical ophthalmology consultant at Liverpool University Hospitals and an honorary senior clinical lecturer at the University of Liverpool. And I studied and trained at Cambridge, Norwich and London. This session will cover the basics of uveitis, what it is, what you might see, what causes it, how we can classify it, things which might make you worried, and the first line management which can be done in the community. And obviously we'll be focusing on those who are training to, to become ophthalmic practitioners. Uh, I want to thank my friend and former colleague at Moorfields Eye Hospital, Mr. Harry Petrushkin, for uh, influencing my approach to this talk. Um, uveitis is a speciality where you can always learn from other people, whatever your role is, whatever their role is, and particularly learning from colleagues, from patients is really crucial in, in, in this uh, subspeciality. Now it's said that the Egyptian physician Imhotep was the first person to describe uveitis back in the third millennium BC. Uh, he was also an architect for the pyramid, so clearly did have an eye for detail. And perhaps this frightening sculpture of Imhotep represents how a lot of people might feel about uveitis. It's a frightening disease to diagnose or manage. But I want to emphasize today that this isn't, or doesn't need to be the case. Uveitis can generate a lot of fear in eye practitioners because it can be seen as complicated or medical. And there's also worry that patients might lose their vision quickly, but the majority of patients don't. Most uveitis is reversible, and the main causes of vision loss are secondary complications like cataracts, glaucoma, and more rarely disease processes like choroidal neovascularization or retinal detachments. Uh, so what does uveitis mean? Well, we're talking about inflammation inside the eye. Uvea itself is the Latin for grape because of the appearance of the organ attached to the stem-like optic nerve. And the term uveal tract refers to these three structures, the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroids. Uh, we include the retina within the bundle as well, even though it isn't strictly speaking part of the uvea. So as with so many things, we can subdivide uveitis in a lot of ways. Classically, the anatomical subdivision is a good starting point, dividing into the front, the middle and the back. And the location is important because symptoms and signs patients get will be reflected by where the inflammation is. The most common front of the eye will have more pain, redness, light sensitivity, uh, the middle might have more floaters, etc. Uh, we call it panuveitis when it spans the layers, but the key point is to ask where the majority of the inflammation is located. So if there's a lot of inflammation in the anterior chamber, but just a few odd cells in the vitreous, then this is more likely to be the spillover of some cells. From location to causes, and we can subdivide uveitis into dozens, possibly even hundreds of causes, but the main question is whether the uveitis is infective or non-infective and then non-infective uveitis can be divided further into different types of autoimmune diseases, trauma, and masquerade syndromes. A clinical and past history is very important here, and always keep an open mind and look out for clues that you can see or hear. So channel your inner Sherlock, Batman, Tintin, Miss Marple, whichever detective you prefer. Uh, and remember that often no specific cause is found, or the uveitis can be multifactorial. So once again, history is crucial. Uh, a regular eye examination, including visual acuities, pupillary response pressures, set lamps, all par for the course. Uh, decisions about whether and what uh, to investigate, of course, do depend on your history and examination findings. Almost any test under the sun can be done in uveitis, but it really does need to be tailored on the individual presentation. Can we measure uveitis? The standardization of uveitis nomenclature or SUN criteria for short, was devised about 30 years ago, and that enables us to quantify cells and flare and the haze in the vitreous. And of course, we use the now ubiquitous OCT imaging to quantify the degree of macular edema. Imaging is of course really useful, whether with OCT or color fundus or wide field optos, and when indicated angiography. But sometimes even a smartphone photo, uh, preferably using an encrypted platform, uh, can help a lot. And moving on to why people might lose uh, vision in uveitis, uh, which makes up around 10% uh, of visual impairment registrations in the UK and around a uh, quarter of cases of legal blindness in the developing world. The key point is that most causes are reversible. Cataracts can be treated surgically, vitritis is usually reversible, and the patient is unlikely to lose uh, vision permanently from this. Uh, macular edema is also treatable, except when there's atrophy of the RPE as a consequence of uh, chronic edema. And the main reason why people might lose vision is because of secondary glaucoma and also the slightly underreported complication of low pressure or hypotony. Uh, this happens especially in young people and it's where chronic anterior uveitis leads to shutdown of the ciliary body and not enough aqueous humours produced. 
this can be quite hard to treat. So sometimes topical steroids can help or to give a substance like oil or viscoelastic, which can act as a scaffold. Treatment of uveitis now. And the first thing to say is that each patient is uh, different as every treatment approach needs to be bespoke uh, for the individual. Uh, we do have a ladder available to follow, which starts with drops, then basic like tablet steroids, uh, followed by second line oral steroid sparing agents uh, or um, agents delivered with other means, and then biologics. And we always want to be proactive rather than reactive in any field, but especially this one. Uh, three important questions to ask yourselves are, one, speed. Is this slow or fast? Uh, some use words like sudden or insidious and then talk about duration as limited if it's less than three months or persistent if it's greater. Number two, threat. Can this uveitis affect the person's vision? And number three, is there any immune compromise? So medications, diabetes, cancer, etc. Uh, but it's also very important to think of whether it affects one eye or both, as bilateral uveitis is more likely to be linked to full body uh, systemic diseases. Now, if you've got a common or garden anterior uveitis, uh, which needs treating, then it's worth hitting it with six weeks of intense topical steroids with whatever your choice of stronger topical steroids. Uh, dexamethasone, Pred Forte, um, starting six times a day, two hourly or hourly, depending on the amount of inflammation. Alongside that, cycloplegia to break down synechiae and uh, whatever else might be needed, such as lubrication uh, if the surface is dry. Starting first line therapy early in these cases is useful not just for the patient but also for whoever sees the patient next. Uh, and if at six weeks things are fine, then usually the patient doesn't need to be seen again. Now, if you call this one uveitis episode, then the patient can have two of these uh, a year. But if they're a frequent flyer and if they're getting three or more, then we need a, a different long term management. Steroid drops are like a, a flimsy band aid or, or, or a plaster. We can put one or two on, but at some point the box will run out. Now let's look at some common A&E presentations. Um, so for example, you get the person who comes in with their umpteenth flare of inflammation, a painful red eye, very light sensitive. You see cells, you see these keratic precipitates. And it's very important to look in the back of the eye uh, in the first instance to rule out a viral retinitis. It's happened quickly. Uh, the threat is usually minor unless the pressure is high and their immune competency usually isn't relevant. Uh, do look at the KP, the keratic precipitates, to see whether they're fat ones, which stay in the endothelium. These might suggest sarcoids, uh, TB, again, sometimes virus. So again, useful to, uh, or important rather, to look in the back. With intermediate uveitis, the patients usually, uh, though not always, uh, present with uh, floaters to their optician or community optometrist, and they may or may not be concerned about a retinal detachment. Often this is a grumbly issue, which um, gets worse in a kind of crescendo, way until they're, they're seen. Um, usually they have no pain, they have a white eye, and again the speed is slow, threat is usually low, unless there is retinal pathology as well. Uh, you might be concerned, of course, if you, you see what appears to be a new intermediate uveitis in the context of a more elderly patient, and in this instance think of lymphoma. Uh, exam findings might include cords of vitreous cells, uh, sometimes described as strings of pearls, so it's useful to have a friendly vitreoretinal surgeon about to think about a biopsy. One presentation which we might put into this bundle is macular edema after cataract surgery uh, with a classic post-cataract volcanic shape representing inflammatory macular edema. Again, this is usually slow and uh, without much threat. Now, looking at things which might get your spidey sense or worry bells going, seeing anterior uveitis patients with an eye which is completely zipped up uh, they've got synechiae, uh, which are adhesions between the iris and other eye structures. And um, the worry is with posterior synechiae at the pupil margin, so where the iris sticks to the anterior lens capsule. And iris bombay happens when there is a complete adhesion, uh, so the patient pitches up with a very, very high pressure. That's where you need a, a friendly glaucoma surgeon for a surgical iridectomy rather than laser or, or other kinds of procedures. Fast moving conditions are of course worrying, uh, typically but not necessarily these are infections and they can again be mixed up with other things both in terms of symptoms and signs. So when you are in the early stages then close monitoring is the key uh, as they can cause visual loss very quickly. Uh, examples which a lot of uveitis specialists and uh, fellows and trainees uh, have experience are the, the quandary between viral retinitis or toxoplasma chororetinitis uh, in the early stages. These have 
very different treatments. So when you do see some worrying spots, it's definitely important to keep an eye out and have a think about the differentials. Hopefully, if you do feel anxiety about what this can be, there's always someone at hand to have a second look. So just to wrap up, these are uh, the things which are really useful for anyone in the community or primary care to do. Number one, a baseline visions. Has the patient had amblyopia since childhood, for example? Number two, baseline imaging so that we can date the pathology and know whether a lesion is three minutes or three decades old. Uh, and also, are there any images from elsewhere that can be sent? OCT, colour, fundus, uh, other eye photos. Number three, get a good medical history. So, so important for uveitis. Number four, uh, being aware of your local emergency pathways and being happy with the time scale. Uh, if the disease has been slow or the threat seems low, then a referral is, is reasonable. If you're worried they are going to lose vision, then sending to the emergency eye clinic is, is absolutely fine. And number five, starting treatment, and sometimes even the simplest things might be worthwhile. So a patient is describing sharp stabbing pain and you see that the surface isn't great. Just making sure that it's well lubricated. Uh, if the pain is dull, then perhaps giving non-steroidals such as profin might be worthwhile. And of course, if very severe or if the patient is vomiting, then they need to get their uh, pressure checked and treated. Now, a lot of uh, patients are also uh, experts of their own condition and, and have a self-management plan, which is fine. Uh, they might have a spare bottle of steroid, but it's still important to let everyone know about this. Um, you know, there are a few times when uh, one might be a bit concerned because it's a viral uveitis rather than a barn door uh, non-infectious anterior uveitis and there's an epithelial defect. These are thankfully very rare, so usually the balance does generally favour starting some treatment, but uh, always be, be cautious. So that's it, uh, just to summarise, don't be scared of uveitis. Uh, the role of the ophthalmic practitioner in the community, in primary care, is essential. Uh, inflammation can be managed safely with specialist support, uh, but of course, do be aware of the I'm just not too sure uh, kind of cases. Uh, thank you for inviting me and I wish you the best for uh, the rest of the day.